Testing one, two, testing one, two, one, two, one, two. House Culture Conversations, DJ Dewey B. How are you? How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you, DJ D. Lott. I'm, I'm glad to be here, man. Hey, well, you can see I'm all smiles today because I've been stoked for this conversation. Uh, we're going to get a real lesson today. Oh, yeah, for sure. We got a yeah, lesson in the house. Lesson. Yeah, exactly right. So now, you know, we have all of these questions that will come from the crowd sometimes. And now we're going to have somebody that can really give some insight when we talk about, you know, house culture and, you know, when you look back to the origins of it all. So I'm going to go ahead and see what we got going on and address the folks over there in Twitch. What's happening in the Twitch universe? I see you. We are getting set up for your questions and comments. Give me one second. I'm going to turn down my uh, volume. There we go. That's my jam. I see you. Welcome aboard. You are already off and chatting. Let me make sure I give you some respect. Good to see you. That's my jam. Thank you for coming. And I see folks already in the audience. Welcome. SpongeBob Dave, it is good to see you. DSSR Anchor 4, I see you. Thank you guys so much. And I see several others of you. You're, you're lurking. I've got your ears. Thank you guys so much. You're in for a treat tonight. You're in the right place. So without further ado, DJ Dewey B, what you think? Bring them on. Let's, hey, you. let's bring on the co-founder of Club Shelter and way, 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 way more than that. And we're about to get to it. Welcome, Merlin Bob. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. Doing great, man. Fantastic. Fantastic. We um, are excited to have this conversation. And, you know, there's so much we want to dig into. So I, I thought maybe we would start with, you know, you came up in New York, right, at a time when you, you've got hip hop and house coming up. Um, and let's talk about the late 70s. Let's kind of frame it around there. What was it like? It, just what was the energy in the city around these two amazing genres that are emerging? Well, let's say I was about 14 when I first started. Uh, as a matter of fact, on my 14th birthday, I, my mother finally allowed me to go out with my cousin. Um, my cousin who happens to be Tony Humphreys. So he lived with me and my mom and uh, he was older than me, four years older than me. So he was going to all these clubs, the loft and the gallery, et cetera, uh, back in 75 or something. And um, he would tell me about it every day, every morning, I should say, he'd come home. Um, so when I was 14, birthday, I was allowed to go out to the loft for the first time. And pretty much after that, it was done. I was out every weekend. Um, but there was in high school at that time, which actually was I in high school or maybe junior high school at that time. Um, everyone was really in New York was into hip hop in high school, everyone, mm -hmm. which I was also because, you know, it started in New York. We felt it was ours, you know, and everyone who was a little older, who was maybe um, college students or, or like my cousin Tony and Etc. was into house music in New York because um, you know we came up with that also at the same time that hip hop music came around. Um, as you know, we're celebrating 50 years of hip hop, uh, and we're also celebrating. To be honest with you, we should be celebrating 50 years of of house music because it's been really that long, if not 72 or 71. To be honest with you, uh, it, especially in New York, uh, we were listening to and uh, for us, it was called back then, not house music, but underground dance music. Uh, for us is what it was called. Uh, and that's back in, you know, 72, 73, maybe, uh, when we were calling it that. Um, and that came from everyone who was um, in the clubs during that time. They were mostly gay clubs, underground dance music. But, you know, even though we weren't, yeah, we were still respected, the crowd respected everyone because it was the best music, the best DJs, the best party uh, in the city. So we were always there. 
And we were also in a lot of um, punk rock clubs at the time. We were also in salsa clubs at the time because all those genres of music were happening and bubbling in New York at the same time. And I think that's interesting when you, you talk about, you know, those different genres. We had the underground dance music, we had hip hop going on and we had this, but you guys went to all these different clubs. And what I often remember DJ Dewey B is that house wasn't a specific genre necessarily. We listened to some disco, we listened to some R&B soul, some Euro, we listened to a lot of different things and the mashup became kind of house over time, but you could hear all kinds of music forms. And, and Merlin, it feels like that's what it was like in New York. Yeah, 100%. Um, it was a melting pot, first of all, with so many diverse um, people and backgrounds that I grew up with. I grew up with, you know, truly a melting pot and um, in New York at that time. And the music rep represented that, it reflected that. And it wasn't anything to us to have our favorite music. I mean, we'd go from Elton John to Love is the Message. You know, it wasn't, it didn't, it was normal. It was normal. We'd go from, you know, the police to whatever else. I mean, just off my top of my head, but we, it was just great music that we were into. And even in the underground clubs that we went to, there was always those sets that Larry would play or T. Scott would play or Larry Patterson would play or, um, that incorporated, um, you know, punk rock music and and all these other elements that, you know, we were into at the time. But, you know, in New York, you could hear in some of the early dance music or house music that was created from those creative people that were in these clubs, including myself and all the other DJs that are popular now, um, they were all listening, you know, and then they would go home and figure out you know, with four or eight tracks, how to produce something. Um, and that's where that whole swell of, you know, underground dance music started to happen. That's great. And I want to just take a moment just to say hello to the fam that's listening in again. We say hello to That's My Jam, SpongeBob Day, DSSR Anchor 4. And um, I see Babu from New Zealand is on. Good to see you. And Bob Peters from The Doctors, back in the day, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you so much. Now, I mean, we could park here, Merlin, but I want to get more into a few other things as well. Uh, about, I guess it's about 20 years after this, you open up a club, Club Shelter. Right. What, was your, your, what was your motivation behind opening that club? The closing of the Paradise Garage was our motivation because <laughs> it was our home, it was our refuge in every way. Um, and the loft had closed also earlier, but, um, but primarily it was, we wanted to have a place where we could bring our family uh, back to and our family being the, all those that we partied with that were inspired by the music and the people and it was important for us to do so because we love the lifestyle and the culture. You know, Timmy and I and Freddie, we just love the culture. We've been in it since we were like 12 years old. So uh, it was always a dream of ours to have this incredible sound system one day. We talked about it when we were teenagers. Yeah, one day we want to have this crazy sound system like the garage and yada, yada, yada. And um, fortunately, Timmy and I were working as music executives at the time. So we said, let's pool and put our resources together and, you know, let's let's open up a club. And it really wasn't about us. You know, we were like young. We were like 21, 22, I think, or something. And we weren't, uh, or 23 maybe at that time. Uh, we weren't really concerned with, we wanted to run a good business, but we really weren't concerned about making money. We were more concerned with, having the best sound system, the best space, the best atmosphere for people to enjoy music the way we did when we were younger. And that was the whole uh, premise on, on Club Shelter. And, you know, 31 years later, it's still a relevant brand in, in uh, dance music. 
And I want to talk about this recent uh, anniversary you threw for your 31st, but we've got questions coming in, as I figured what happened. The question is, how did you meet Timmy Regisford? Um, well, we both are from New York. We both were born in Brooklyn. We're both, our fathers, families are from Trinidad. And um, so in New York, for instance, just to give you a background, in the mid 70s, uh, low income families were able to come into the city and to these new buildings that went up in New York. And his mother and my mother were very fortunate to get us in because we were in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, which was like, you know, <laughs> it's it was do or die Bed-Stuy is what we called it, okay? So it changed our lives. And Timmy and I actually, he got in one apartment because he was there with his brother and sister and I was in the other apartment. <laughs> so we've been best friends since we were uh, 10, 11 years old. Now, I know that some people, on we can't see their faces, but I know they're doing the, wow, you grew up with Timmy Registry. That's crazy, right? Mind's blown. But you guys went on and um, you guys built Club Shelter. What was unique about Club Shelter? Um, I think what was unique was that this is the first time to brothers or men of color have owned any nightclubs in New York and in Manhattan at that. Um, and this genre of music uh, with this crowd and it was well, well respected. And I think the crowd really respected the space. They, you know, honored the space. Um, even when we moved, we moved maybe two or three times to different spaces over the course of the 30 something years. But um, there's always been that that real honest respect and um, that feeling of real home, like refuse, because, you know, we've all kind of came from the same place. And here you're coming to a place, the first and only, you know, that, you know, people of color designed, built, put together uh, for everyone, you know, not just for other people of color, but all ethnicities, uh, you know, LBGDQ community, et cetera, you know, it was all everyone together. And that is the one thing for me that, you know, was a unique aspect that I'm very proud of and that we're very proud of. Now, there's an overlay uh, across all of this, which is an illustrious music A&R career. And I, I want you to kind of take us there, tell us a little bit about that part of your, your life and that career, because you not only worked with the best names in house, but the best names in hip hop and other genres. Well, um, you know, it started when I was um, 16. And I don't know if I mentioned this, but my cousin is Tony Humphrey. So he was living with me and my mother when we were living next door to Timmy. Um, so the three of us were always out going to record stores, running around together. And then Tony taught me and Timmy how to DJ. Um, and then we all said, okay, we're gonna have our own styles. <laughs> we're not gonna emulate each other, but he's the one that taught us how. Um, at that point, I was loving DJing, but I knew I wanted to do more in the business creatively and business-wise. Like I wanted to understand the business side of it. Um, so Tony took me to one day, we went to Prelude Records to pick up some vinyl. And we picked it up from this gentleman named Larry Patterson. And when we left, I asked Tony what who he was and what he did. Cause you know, I, to go to a record label back then was a big deal, you know, as teenagers, I mean, it was a big deal. And um, he told me, well, he's the A&R person. He's the art, he's the artist and repertoire. A record label doesn't run unless you have an A&R person and a department, you know, uh, he's the one that signs the artists, you know, develops them, picks the songs, picks the producers, makes the star, so to speak. And at that moment, I had one of those light bulb moments <laughs> where I said to Tony, that's what I'm going to do. And uh, of course, he looked at me like, you're crazy. There ain't no black people doing that <laughs> in this business, <laughs> you know, especially as an executive or anything like that. 
Um, and I didn't think about it much after that. I just knew it's something that I, I knew what my goal was, so to speak. So long story short, it, it, it went from that, me continuing to DJ, to continue to DJ on the radio, because Timmy was on the radio at BLS, which was the number one station in the country at that time. And Tony was on KISS FM, which is the number two station in the country at that time, which is the thing that blew our minds because, you know, we dreamed about this, but we eventually, there's long stories to how it got there, but just to cut it short, Timmy was on the radio and then he asked me to fill in for him when he went to play in London at Ministry of Sound back then. And um, I went on and it went well. So Timmy and I were doing Friday and Saturday on BLS and Tony was on KISS. And because I was doing the show on the radio station, they asked me to actually work at the station. And I became assistant music director. So in other words, I was the person who all the record labels would come in and play their songs. And myself and the program director would decide what gets played. I mean, what gets added to the radio station. And because of that, and because the station was doing so well, I was like for two or three years, I was doing this with him. Uh, BK Kirkland was his name. Um, he was a great program director. Um, the, rate, the label started saying, hey, you know, if you can pick great records for the radio station in your, for the country, you should be able to pick great artists. And that's when it started, Atlantic Records and Columbia and one other label started asking me if I wanted to come to A&R. And it was like my dream job, of course. So I took meetings with all three of them and decided to go with Atlantic Records. And you have worked with the game, some of the great names. What are a couple of, of uh, cool artists you remember working with? Uh, um, well, I signed Missy Elliott, um, which was which is one I'm very proud of, especially because. Um, well, I find sign MC Light first, which is the first female rap artist. Wait, wait, time, time, time. I, I got to you. You signed MC Light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's one of my faves. One of my oh, really? first. One of my first hip hop little CDs. Well, we were we still cassettes then? I think we was cassettes. Yeah, yeah, then. probably. <laughs> That's incredible. Uh, who is great? And MC Light is wonderful. She's still wonderful, uh, and it's so wonderful when you work with. Artists, I've been working with artists for the last 40 years. Okay, no, 40 years, I'm talking about 30 years. <laughs> 30 something years. And, um, but it's great when you can work with those that have had a lot of success and still have a, a name in the business and still doing well, uh, and they haven't changed, you know. And there's very few that <laughs> I can say that, but those that do, you know. But um, also sign Yo-Yo also, um, and I did a deal with, Queen Latifah, who was wonderful, wonderful. And um, then I signed Missy Elliott, and I'm just so proud of her and what she's accomplished over the years. Um, and that she's been going into the, the, the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and all these things, it's really great. But you know, I signed Pharrell back then and Pusha T and, and John Legend and, you know, in Vogue I signed and, Buster Rhymes, I did all his albums and Keith Sweat and his albums. And, you know, I can go on and on. It's, it's, it's my primarily, I was responsible for R&B and hip hop when I came to Atlantic. And, but, you know, I also wanted to sign other artists and kind of give a, give the labels a, 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 lesson on house music, you know, and dance music. So I started hiring my friends to do a lot of remixes for the R&B artists that I was working with and and um, and giving them production deals, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I gave Kerry Chandler his first production work and and uh, Roger S is Roger Sanchez and David Morales and um, Louie and Kenny, I mean, I can go on. Everybody who I kind of came up with, we were all came up at the same time. I thought it was important to to give back to that. And 
then I signed Ten City um, with uh, Marshall Jefferson and um, CC Rogers and with Marshall also. Um, but you know, it it I've literally you know have the albums that I've released over the years have sold over close to 200 million albums and they stream like, you know, I don't know, five, six billion, I don't know, more than that probably. I don't even know now, but it's a blessing, you know, to be able to to do what it is that you love um, and to do it in all various kinds of genres. And I was the director of a and when I first went to Atlantic and they were number 11 company in R&B and I took them to number two, no, number one in two years. So I got promoted to VP of a &R when I was like 24 and um, then had a very much success with a lot of our artists on the pop charts. So I asked them to let me have uh, my own label. So they gave me a label called East West that was prominent in London. And I started it here in the States and we had a lot of success with that. And because of that, um, the next step was I, I became executive vice president of, of Electra Records. And um, and it's so funny, every time I would see Tony, he'd laugh and like, okay, I know, I know, I was wrong. I was wrong. Because <laughs> yeah, there, and fortunately at that time in the music business, there were quite a few of us that were you know, running actual record labels, not just the black or R&B department of labels, but the entire label. So I I had to deal with, and I, and I you know, groups like Simply Red back then and, and Metallica, believe it or not, and ACDC and, you know, uh, Tracy Chapman and Anita Baker and, you know, all these other artists uh, for years. That's incredible. Hey, we're sitting here with Merlin Bob, House Culture Conversations. Family, I see you out there. Thanks for joining us. I agree with your incredible resume. Just amazing. And it was something you said, Merlin, when we were just uh, getting getting on the air about, you know, I asked a question, oh, you know, do you any producing? And you said something I thought that was really profound. And you, I don't know if you want to take a moment to just talk about when you got into the business, you figured out where your strengths were. Well, yeah, when I first started, um, when I was at the radio station still and going into the labels, because um, I was still doing, you know, and these, everybody to know, this was a lot of freaking work. It wasn't like, I know I'm going to go through a timeline, but we never slept. <laughs> never slept we worked our ass off you know like literally um but i used to go um from the radio station to this recording studio to learn how to engineer and to produce afterwards and that's that meant me just going into a session you know if i had to go out and get somebody's lunch i could care less you know as long as they could let me sit there and learn so I learned how to engineer, et cetera. And when I got to Atlantic, I wanted to start producing also. And um, I did really well when it came to engineering. And because I mixed practically almost every other album that came out in Atlantic back then. Um, but when it came to producing, I was like, I don't like what I freaking hear. You know, I don't like what I'm doing. I'm like, this is not my thing, you know? And, I can, and it's okay, because I said, I can't do everything. And if there's something I want to do, but I can't, and I don't do it well, I have to be smart enough to say, okay, let me put my strengths in the things that I knew I can do very well. So I never really produced anything. I did a few remixes, but, and to this day, it's still not my thing. So, you know, even now, as I, I speak to all my, my peers, uh, DJ wise, cause I just started DJing again last year. Um, I say to them all, like, give me your, all your music, send me tons of music, all of them, right. Louis to, you know, David to, to Kitty, et cetera. Um, because they know I'll play their music cause I'm not playing my own, you know, mm -hmm. cause I'm not into producing that much at all. Yeah. I think that's, you, you gotta know your strengths though. You gotta be <laughs> honest with yourself in this business. 
I absolutely ag agree. And, you know, it's important that people realize that the business is a lot of times you have a DJ and then he wants to remix, produce that kind of thing. There are other avenues of to course. participate in, in the business. And I appreciate that you brought that uh, to your point. DJ Dewey B, you know, as you've in your career, just not only a DJ, but producing your thoughts. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, Merlin speaking the truth. I do have a question, though. Um, just to take the veil off of the secrecy of a &R work, how did you handle submissions? And what do you think has changed from that time period to now on uh, submitting work, work to labels? So you said, how did I handle the submissions? Yeah, how did you handle it? I don't think there's been a time that I got signed an artist just from a submission, to be honest with you. I mean, I'd have stacks of CDs and and tapes and everything else and that tapes and, you know, uh, whatever it may be. But um, you can sign artists such a various amount of ways, so ancillary ways. Um, predominantly, they'll come from what you may be out in here. You know, you have to be out there. You have to be, and I'm talking about then. Now is a totally different animal, okay? But then, and when I say then, up until maybe 2003, let's say. So 20 years ago almost now, it's crazy. But up until that time, um, you know, you could be out. And with what you hear and if who you're following and what you, you, you know the marketplace either uh, wants or the marketplace is ready to accept. Um, but you can get artists from managers. Um, I got artists from lawyers. Um, and it doesn't mean that just because they're a big manager or a lawyer that you're going to sign it just because. No. But they usually, uh, artists will come to them and they'll bring them to me. Um, I got artists from hearing something independently that, you know, I felt, you know, can go to the next level, you know? Um, today is a totally different um, dynamic. Today it's primarily um, not so much off of your talent as it is off of your personality. And if you have a good enough song to go along with it, then, and you have enough followers and, the numbers are right and the analytics are right, then you can get signed, uh, most likely get signed. Uh, labels don't necessarily do artist development as they used to at, uh, many years ago, uh, where you sign an artist. Sometimes I'd sign artists to take, I signed Brandy, right? It's, I did a whole album with Brandy when she was 14. And um, I did it with um, Daryl Williams, who was my a &R person at the time, VP and a &R under me. Um, and uh, we did the first album and we listened to it and it was like, wait a minute, she's 15 now and he sounds sound too kitty. We went back and did a whole nother album. Um, and that's the one that came out, her first. Um, so, you know, it takes time. You had to develop these artists, you know, an overnight sensation we say in the business is 10 years in the making. You know, because every artist we know today, up until the early 2000s, <laughs> has been developed to be a star. The, the, making the songs, uh, finding the right song, finding the right producer. Um, and if you find a self-contained artist even, um, you still have to go through that with them also, you know, and getting the best song and, and they have to have confidence in your ear, you know. Um, and being an AR person is really back then up until the early 2000s is really having a sixth sense. You know, you just know it. It's, I tell people, they ask me, how do I do it when I don't sing and I don't produce and I don't do these things? I say it's almost like having a, a um, coach in basketball who's won several rings, but he never played. He never won a champion. He was the worst player on the team when he played, but he knew how to, he knows how to take them to championships, you know? Um, it's a similar kind of thing. You just have, you have a knack for it. And 
Um, so yeah, it's a totally different now than it was then. Now it's completely all about analytics and followers and popularity. And sometimes the music comes last, you know, unfortunately, but you know, that's, that's where we are now, you know, I'm not knocking it because it's the trend that has happened. And because music hasn't developed a new genre in 50 years, there's no new genres. Everything is a subgenre. It's already been. So until there's a new genre of music that people can sincerely get behind and be happy about and content about and, and build on, then we're just going to be rehashing what we have in echoes, but so far after 50 years. That's a great point. Great point. Great question, DJ Dewey B. Uh, any other question on the music? Uh, yeah, I, I do have many, many more questions. But we have a certain amount of time. <laughs> yeah, I, ask away. Ask away. It's not every day you get to ask a, a legend in this game That's it. questions that you might, in your career, try. it might try to help you. But um, the main thing is I want to know is would you do it again? Like if you wanted to start out today, would you go back into trying to be an A&R person or would you just – kind of just go into label development and, and develop it from that side of it. Yeah, hundred percent. I do it today. Um, because today there are so many ancillary ways in, and avenues for you to do artists and repertoire or develop artists or be in the actual business side of music because you have so many, um, streaming companies and, uh, publishing, more publishing going companies and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ancillary companies that deal with music every day. Music is being utilized more now than it ever has in its history. So there's definitely, you know, but it's still a close net business. You know what I mean? Like it's still about who you know and how you build your brand to get in. You can go to college. You can do a lot of different things. It may help for you to get your internship and get in. But at the end of the day, it's still a business um, that has to want you. And um, but I, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to do this today with you guys is because I'm, I'm, I'm at the stage now where I just consult, you know. So I have the time now to really give back and to do um, and encourage and educate as much as possible because I want to see young people, you know, get into the business side of this and the creative side of it and not think that you just have to be an artist or a producer or a songwriter to actually be in the music business. You don't, you know, and there's so many other ancillary um, uh, avenues for you to go to be in it. Uh, if you really believe you have that sixth sense for it. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Now, recently you uh, had your 31st anniversary for Club Shelter. Talk about that event, some of the DJs you had there, and why was that so special? Um, well, it was like a coming back for all of us together. <laughs> Everybody, that's another thing that was important for us too at, at uh, Shelter, because all the other clubs uh, had one DJ who primarily, you know, everybody was, you know, um, loving and, and honoring and respecting. And like, there was their hero, like Larry LeVan was my hero and T. Scott was my hero. And so, um, but we wanted us, me and Timmy were gonna do this, but we also wanted to bring in everybody we knew to actually DJ there. Like if we had to fly, if I had to go to Japan and play, if he had to go, you know, we didn't just take each other, we'd have Louis there. We'd have, you know, Tony there, we'd have, um, France Parquet there. We'd have, you know, whoever it was, I don't think of it, DJ Clark Kent there, you know, <laughs> Finna there, you know, whoever it was um, at the time that was part of the family, you know, we felt we wanted to do whatever we could do to lift them up, you know, and bring them up and give them the opportunity. Um, and so this 31st anniversary, a lot of uh, the guys came together. It was Joe, uh, Carcel, uh, Louis, Vega, um, Francois K, Tony Alfries, Timmy, and myself. And who am I missing? Who am I missing? Somebody I'm missing. 
but it was um, all of us came together for the 31st anniversary and it was really great party. And, you know, um, I don't know if we closed till one o'clock the next day or something. <laughs> <laughs> I heard it was epic. I heard so many people that went to the, uh, the event and they just, they're they still on cloud nine. And I love what you said about giving others an opportunity to shine. And and not just hope, keeping it for yourself. This well, is that, our club, and this is where we that, play. That goes to what you asked earlier about what made Shelter different than other clubs, because other clubs didn't have. Now now they do, you know. Now they do. There's like different DJs. It's not really one DJ, a resident at most clubs that just plays all the time now. And we like to think that we helped start that because we had everyone coming in and out. Um, that we respected and that we knew had a fan base that wanted to hear them, but they didn't have their own place or their own club. Um, so yeah, that was important for us. Absolutely. Now I have a question from SpongeBob Dave out, out of the UK. He's asked, is there ever a DJ you wish you had booked, but you weren't able to uh, book him for Club Shelter? Um. I was gonna say Larry Levan, but even Larry Levan played there. Um, probably David Manacuso. Mm. Um, is the only one I could think of, because everyone else pretty much played there. <laughs> That's that is awesome. Now SpongeBob Dave also said he'd like for you to adopt him if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got four kids now, so I don't know if I have room. <laughs> Now, speaking of your kids, your kids are also in the business and you were making the statement that you want to help. Now that you, you've you know, done your thing and you want to give back to future generations and preserving the culture and house, talk a little bit about ways you're doing that. Um, well, I'm starting with, you know, this show and others like it and magazines. I've been doing a lot of interviews and, um, you know, just making myself more available um, than I was in the past. Believe me, all those years, it was it was nonstop. I mean, nonstop. Needless to say that and owning clubs for three, 30 years and working as executive for three, three years and DJing and I was on the radio for all those years. So, you know, now it's, it's um, now I'm like slowed down, like, and it feels good. So now I want, you know, when it comes to programs like yours, et cetera, you know, I want to be available. Um, and I just started this in the last, like last year after our anniversary, because all mm -hmm. the guys that were there playing, they said, come on, you should start again. You're consulting now. You have time. You just do it. So I, you know, I started DJing again, but it's not just about me DJing again. It's me connecting with the, the, um, the culture again, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which I wasn't sure about because I've been away for so long, but, uh, fortunately I had all those years prior that I was, you know, made a name for myself as a DJ. So fortunately I was able to come right back in and, and get gigs and be playing. But you know, every time I play somewhere, I meet somebody different who has aspirations in some way and I give them advice. So I, you know, put them in the right direction or, you know, or um, do whatever I can do, you know, mm -hmm. it means that makes sense, you know. And we really appreciate that. Just knowing that, you know, you shifted that gear and you're giving to the culture. Uh, it means everything. DJ Dewey and B and I talk about that all the time. Uh, at some point, you got to give back and help others. And, and that's well, just amazing. To hear. That's always been important to me during my course of being in the industry. When I was an executive for all those years, I was always, my door was always open because I know that I wouldn't be sitting in that seat if it's other doors weren't open for me. There's so many people who, you know, pulled me up um, when I needed it and when I didn't expect it, you know? So I always felt it was important, but I, that, that was an area of the music industry where I was always doing it. Now I want to do it also for the culture of house music because I feel like, you know, we started this, you know, mm -hmm. so. I think it's important, just like, you know, you could say um, Africa Ben Bader or somebody started the hip hop culture. You know what I mean? I feel like, you know, um, us in New York, 
the DJs I've mentioned prior and myself, we started the um, the genre and the, and the movement and the culture, you know, from day one. So um, I think it's important for us to support that and to keep it moving because, you know, it went away for a long time. It went to Europe for many, many years, which is fine, but uh, it's kind of come full circle now. And I'm fortunate to be coming back in at the time when it's coming full circle. So that's why I want to do as much uh, and make sure the history of it is understood. And we appreciate that so much. Hey, you're listening to House Culture Conversation, an amazing conversation with Merlin Bob. Dewey, I, I know we had a question come in about one of uh, the albums that you would have uh, been involved with. I think it was a Blaze Motown album. Uh, DJ Dewey B, you remember... <laughs> The question on that one, maybe it was a comparison between Blaze and uh, Ten City, I think it was. <laughs> well, what happened is, you know, Timmy did Blaze at Motown. Because remember, I told you, he was an executive in Motown, and I was executive at Atlantic at the time. And so he did um, the Blaze album, and I did the uh, Ten City album. And of course, you know, we're out, we're best friends and we've been business partners since we were like 12 years old, but you know, we're still competitive. And, you know, my brother, Timmy, man, I just want to say, is Tony, of course, like I said, you know, was responsible for me as a young kid. I wouldn't be seeing here without him, but Timmy too, you know, he's been the most supportive best friend that I've had and we're still partners in crime. Um, but you know he's he's done a lot too in the music side of things, like at Motown and at Universal for many years. You know people don't know that he signed a lot of hip hop artists. He signed Eric B and Rakim. Oh wow! Know? Yeah, definitely. He signed Guy. You know, and he signed a lot of R and B and hip hop groups also. You know, because we both had that aspiration. You know, um, of wanting to do as much as we can in the music business, uh, not just. DJing, which we love, you know, was our backbone. Um, but we knew there was more to this and um, that was important. So that's, that's great. DJ Dewey B, I know you had a list. I want to let you slide one in. I, I got about two more that I want to ask, but DJ Dewey B, go for it. This is a real quick one now. Merlin, how do you feel about the sound systems that you're hearing if you go out any? Because I don't get out that much either, but. You know, we, we talked about the Paradise Garage, and I'm sure the shelter was right up there with the top of the line sound systems in the world. How do you feel about the sound systems that you're hearing these days? Um, yeah, I've been going out a lot more now than I had in the last, you know, decade, let's say, because mm -hmm. I started playing again. And, you know, it's understandable that not every club can have that premier sound system um, that we used to have because it's a lot of work and these days it's very expensive. You can spend a half a million dollars on a good system, you know? Yes. So um, I think, uh, you know, nothing compares to the sound systems that like we had at the shelter or that the garage had or David had it at Manicuso had at the, the loft or anything like that. Um, I mean, when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, like I said, I used to be in the loft and I used to just sit inside the bass speakers all night. I just sit there inside of it. Um, and there's very few people that could do that now because the speakers, and there are very few speakers that are even on the floor anymore. Everything is right. around you up. Um, so yeah, if I had to make a comparison, nothing compares. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, a lot of these clubs and spaces are doing the best that they can, to be honest with you. Um, and a lot of them rely on the talent um, more so than the sound system. Talent being in the DJ yes. and his following. And, you know, was, you know, most of the people are not complaining about it. So, you know, but I know when it comes to us and our parties and our, you know, it has to be the best system. It has to be. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Sound is everything, I tell you. Yeah. So now just, it, it's been a little bit over a year, but you came back to DJing and you came back by uh, doing a performance at the uh, Boiler Room in New York City. Uh, tell us about that. 
Well, my good friend, uh, like I told you, Kerry Chandler, um, he's been encouraging me to play again for the longest. Uh, between him and, like I said, Clark Kent and DJ Spinner, and um, they've been on me to get playing again. <laughs> so um, I had started, like I said, a little bit um, last year when we had a party in May or something. Um, so Kerry said, listen, I'm going to do a boiler room and I'm going to tell them I want you to open for me. And I was like, ah, come on, brother, boiler room. I haven't been around in umpteen years. Boiler room doesn't even know me. <laughs> so he, he hit me back. He's like, man, are you kidding me? They was like, please, can you get him to do it? Um, so I did it. I, and, and it was an amazing, um, I always wanted to do it, funny enough. <laughs> And I never thought I would actually, but um, it was a great night. Really, a really great night. A lot of fun. Um, and but that's how I came about. And uh, you know, my hat goes off to Carrie because, like I said, I gave him his. Matter of fact, Carrie came to me. He was 18 years old or something, or 19. And I came to my office and he said, "You know, I want to produce. You know, I want to produce house music." And I we had just opened Shelter, and I said, "Well, if you." I tell you what, if you can give me an anthem for our new club, he's like, what's the name of it? I said, Shelter. I said, if you can give us an anthem, then I'll give you a budget to actually go in and produce some songs. So he came back to me with, with the, the theme song, the Shelter song. Um, and it was a big hit, you know, and it was the first record we put out on Shelter Records. Yeah, so, I'm you know, sure it's good cool. when people don't forget. Is what I was going to say. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it doesn't happen too often in this business, so when it does, it's 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 a cool thing, you know. And so I wanted to ask the the question: How are, are you you playing out regularly now, or is it just kind of ad hoc as you find those uh, spots? Actually, for fun. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I'm doing awesome. it for fun. So, awesome. you know, if it makes sense, you know, then I'll do it. Uh, like I said, and. Um, Yes, it's really for fun. I'm not trying to, you know, take anyone's shine or anything like that or <laughs> that kind of stuff. No, no, no. I'm, I'm really doing it for fun. And I'm having a ball, though. I'm having, I'm enjoying it. That is awesome. So we ran into each other in Twitch, actually. And so I want to ask your thoughts about Twitch, its, its impact. What do you think about it? now that so many DJs get the opportunity to stream to their communities online. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful asset. I mean, I think it's, like I said, there's so many ancillary ways for you to um, build your brand. Um, you know, we had, we were fortunate, me, Timmy and Tony, we had the ultimate outlet to build our brand, which was radio. You know, we were on the radio for a decade or more, every single night, I mean, every single weekend, um, doing an underground dance party, you know? Mm -hmm. So we were able to do that for many, many years. Uh, and that built our brand that got us to get out of, you know, travel and, you know, at a young age and do so many different things. Um, so right now there's so many different ways that back then that was the way, unless you went out and played in the park, you know, mm -hmm. um, or you owned a club back then. And, you know, we couldn't own a club when we were late teenagers, you know. So I think that what's happening now with Twitch is is great. You know, I think it's a great outlet for everyone to utilize it. And just like anything else, just because you get on Twitch doesn't mean you're, you're, you're going to be popular, okay? You got to do your work. You got to, you know, figure out what your niche is, what your audience is. You know, you it's work. And that's another thing I want to say. You know, none of this is easy being in the music business in any capacity. None of it is easy, it's a lot of work. Um, but like anything else, if you love it that much, then you'll, you know, you'll do the work. And, but don't think it's gonna just, you know, just because you get on Twitch and you're gonna have, you know, you've been on it for six months and you're wondering why you have three followers, it's because you're not being sincere about what you're doing. You're not doing the right work and you're not, you know, doing your homework and doing your research, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and see, and looking at the competition, et cetera. So, uh, but I, I think it's a great outlet and all the other outlets out there now, you know, IG Live and et cetera, all of those are great. 
I mean, look at Dean Nice, you know, we're really good friends. And, and I never forget him, well, Clark, I think, called me and said, yeah, I told D to, you know, go on. He's just playing records. Why not just keep DJing? And look, look at him now. <laughs> he's like, he's killing it. He's got, you know, what, you know, 5 million followers now. And like, he's just, uh, you know, went to a whole nother level. And he was doing great before that, but, you know, the outlet is what did it. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. DJ Dewey B. Yes, sir. Any any last question? I've got one more. Okay. And I'm going to let you go, DJ Dewey B. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, Merlin, you know, a lot of people really don't understand the economics of music and what it costs to produce a record, number one, and to hire Merlin Bob, what that would cost. Now, I'm not trying to get in your business, but can you explain to the people that this is not an industry where $50 gets you anything or $100 gets you anything? Because people don't understand that no. your time is worth a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, you like I said, you put in a lot of hard work and you worked on your brand for all these years, then, you know, you build a brand to utilize it for various things. And one of those biggest things is income. So, That's right. you know, if you're going to, if you want to be, if you're an artist or a producer or a songwriter, or whatever it may be, and you want to attach yourself to someone who has a, a major brand. And when I say brand, I'm speaking of artists, like, you know, the names, their names, whoever it is you're talking about. Drake is a brand, you know, or, you know, et cetera. Um, or if you want to get, you know, Louis Vega to do something for you, that's a brand, you yes. know? So, you know, just like any other brand, you're not going to be able to utilize it without understanding that there's a major payment to be made there, you know? Um, so that's just something to understand. But at the same time, you know, you have to understand if that's the best thing for you, you know, because, a lot of people think just because I go in and get A, B, or C, no name, known name, that I'm going to blow up. But it doesn't. It doesn't work that way. It might be still one in a million that it really does happen that way, because you know we're in a time now where it's really not all about the song. It, we used to be in a time where it really was all about the song. Like we always say in the business, you know, a hit record can cure anything. You know. But it's not like that anymore. It's really, you have to have, now you can still have great songs and still have a underground, you know, um, independent following, which I think is beautiful because one of the reasons I love where we are now is because so many people get to express their talent, whereas we were the gatekeepers up until 2003, 2004. Mm -hmm. Nobody heard any music unless it came through myself or others like me in the record labels. I mean, all over the world, I'm talking about. No, you, no one heard anything. Whereas now, you know, anybody could put out anything, and which I think is great because everyone has that opportunity. But of course, the consumer has to weed through a whole lot of bad music to get to good music. Whereas we, you know, we washed out all that bad music prior because we were the gatekeepers, but that's not happening anymore. Um, so I think it's great that, you know, from a independent level that, um, or that artists can build their fan base without having commercial success. But if you're that kind of artist, then that's great for you. I think it's wonderful. But if you're the type of artist who's trying to go after a big name, obviously you're trying to be, have commercial success. And that doesn't always work. So it makes more sense to really try to establish your own sound and, and establish your own unique music um, because it'll be respected even more so. Absolutely. I appreciate that. One last question for you. Frankie Knuckles leaves New York and comes to Chicago in the late 70s. Up until that time, as you called it, it was underground dance music. I'd like to settle the score. It was called <laughs> house music in Chicago first. <laughs> well, yeah, Frankie was uh, here playing in 
in our underground dance music club. He's from Brooklyn, like me and Tony and Timmy. Like we're all from Brooklyn and we all understood what that music was. And like I said, everyone who was in those clubs during the time from like 74 up until whenever, um, was inspired by what we heard in those clubs. So when we all went home to produce something, that's what we were coming up with, underground dance music. Um, but I give Chicago 100% credit for coming up with the brand name. Now, I don't know what was happening in Chicago in 74, 75, if anybody had produced music, because Boy Javis, who worked with us, was putting all these tracks up uh, very early on. And he's the one that did Colonel Abrams and all these other things that came out eventually commercially, but five, six years before that, he had tracks that were, that could be considered house music tracks. Um, so we'd been doing it for a while and Frankie was aware of it too, back then, you know? Um, but I don't really care. I just care that it's black music. You know, I don't care if New York was first, second or third, Chicago was first, Detroit, uh, Baltimore. Um, they were all, it was all happening in these clubs. So wherever those clubs were during that time, you know, is where this all came from. Because like I told you before, um, Love is the Message is house music. Yeah. We'd hear that. That inspired us, you know what I mean? And that was that came out in 1972. And Bra, you know, by Samanda, I think it's called. And that came out in 71. I mean, that was the first, like, real four on the floor. Boom, boom, boom. I mean, so, and we were all listening to that and partying to that in, in the clubs back then. And that was our that was our thing, you know? Well, Merlin, I just want to thank you for your time and for sharing with us. DJ Dewey B, any last thoughts? We're going to let Merlin get back to doing what he does best. And yes. I was celebrating the culture. How do we, how do we find you on Twitch there, Merlin? What's your, your DJ? Well, I'm not, honestly, I don't even know my Twitch. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I'm on IG more than anything else. You know, I'm just getting back into it, bro. I, I have I, the Twitches I do are for shelter records mostly. And okay. I do for Jihad Muhammad and for, uh, David Morales, I do their Twitch shows. I don't have one myself. Um, and I do it for Freddie for Shelter Records. But um, but the best place to get me is on on IG at uh, Club Shelter NYC. Very good. That's it. That's it. Well, thank you so much, Merlin Bob. Everybody out there. You heard it here. We can't add or take anything away from what's been said here tonight. Just a special person that carries so much of the culture. He, I mean, he's forgotten more about the culture than we, we, we know. And we just want to thank you so much, Merlin, for your time. And everybody else, we'll see you next time. Peace. Thank you, guys. You bet. All right.